second speaker is Miguel Minos Rojo. He received his PhD in 2015 in condensed matter physics nanotechnology from the Spanish National Research Council and the master bachelor degrees in physics from the Autonomous University of Madrid. During his PhD, he studied how the reduction of dimensionality affects the transport properties of organic and inorganic thermoelectric materials. From 2016 to 18, he became a post postdoctoral researcher at Stanford University, studying two-dimensional materials and devices based on them for thermal, electrical, and thermal electric applications. In 2018, he became a tenure track assistant professor at Trinity University. His line of research focused on thermal management, energy harvesting, nano and micro scale thermometry, and thermal sensing. You can also visit his group page for more information. The title of his talk is Nanoscale Thermal Mapping of Electronic Devices. All right, so um, first of all, I would like to, to thank the young organizers and especially uh, Dr. Faye Hui and Professor Mario Lanza for this um, invitation. And I'm really happy to be here in this community, in this AFM community, and excited to, to give this talk. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on thermal mapping of uh, electronic devices. Uh, of course, this thermal mapping is with an AFM-based technique. And I would like to start my talk with uh, the motivation to, to, to work in this field. Uh, I think we are all familiarized with the conventional Moore's law that states that every two years, the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles. Uh, there are many challenges associated to scaling, speed, and so on and so forth, but we should also account for the impact of energy dissipation in electronics. And within this context, we can have a look at this uh, figure and we can see the CPU power density, uh, how it has evolved per year. What we observe is that actually our electronics have been limited by heat since 2005. When we look at our electronics, at our individual devices, what we observe is that these devices can heat up from few degrees to few hundreds of, the, of degrees. And when we start putting this uh, electronic device into a circuit, and this is an example of a CPU, what we observe is that the heat that is going to be released from this uh, circuit board, it could actually be uh, quite considerable. And this picture illustrates very well that the heat released by electronic or by this uh, CPU could actually be enough to boil an egg. Well, as you can imagine, things get worse and worse as we keep on piling electronics. And one example is that, that, that you can observe in data centers. Uh, in that data center, there's an enormous amount of heat that is released. And if we look at the energy that we invest for cooling, it's actually even larger than the one that we use for servers, storage, or network. So this has led to actually this industry to take drastic solution and move some of these data center to very cold places in order to cool down their electronics more effectively. But within this context, I think we need to focus also on gaining fundamental thermal insights of our electronic devices. That means understanding their thermal properties, thermal, for example, conductivity of some of the oxide, of some of the novel uh, materials that are being used to fabricate our new electronic devices, and also the heat that is dissipated in novel electronic architectures, and also learn how to manage this heat, because this is an essential aspect to our electrify, electrify future. Well, taking that into account, we, I mentioned that it's very important to gain uh, fundamental knowledge or gain like these thermal insights of our electronics. But then the question is, how can we measure temperature? And when we look at the classical method, when we have a look at the microscopic picture, what we observe is that typically we use thermometers that approach the heat, uh, to a hot body, and these thermometers are going to give us a temperature reading. Well, this is okay, but when we look at the nanoscale and microscale of these electronic devices, what we observe is that the size of these, uh, for example, thermometers could be too large to actually get an accurate reading of this temperature. And there are all the things that are playing a role, like thermal interfaces. So we need for approaches that can actually measure at the nano and micro scale that can measure these temperatures. Classical approaches are, for example, electrothermal methods in which uh, they use a, a metal line that can be used both as 
heat there as a sensor. So with this, you can obtain local information of the thermal properties of your sample or explore some interesting thermal phenomenon uh, that, uh, that you can have, for example, in different type of sample, like three, five materials, like this example on, on two-dimensional electron gases that you can find in, in these type of structures. Uh, but the problem is that you cannot obtain thermal maps. In this case, this is a very local measurement of the thermal properties of your sample. When we talk about devices, what we are interested in is in a spatially resolved device thermometry. And if we look around, what we have is different techniques, like for example, some optical base, like infrared thermometry that allows a very large scale temperature maps with a spatial resolution of around five micrometer. We can do it better uh, using some optical techniques. And another example is the Raman thermometry in which you have a spatial resolution about 0.5 micrometer. But the advantage here is that actually, as far as your materials have Raman signatures, you could actually get 3D maps of these, uh, of these devices. Um, and I think when we talk about high spatial resolution, one of the techniques that allow actually to obtain local information uh, with special uh, resolution in the, in the nanoscale with something around 50 nanometers, the best case scenario, is the scanning thermal microscopy. And the scanning thermal microscopy is an, an AFM-based technique, which typically use a nanoscale tip uh, that can work both as a local heater or as a thermometer. And uh, let me give you a bit more information about this technique for those who are not familiarized with it. So as I said, um, as the size of materials and devices shrink to nanometer, atomic, or even quantum scale, it is more and more challenging to characterize the thermal properties reliably. A scanning thermal microscopy is a technique that is known but is now emerging to obtain local information of electronic devices by controlling and monitoring probe sample thermal exchange processes. In this figure over here, uh, I think we all know what an AFM is. Um, what we do is to integrate this uh, STHM prop uh, into a classical AFM. And then we use a special design apart that, that actually allows to record the signal that is coming from this uh, thermal prop and that to give us information about the thermal properties of our sample. Then with this kind of system, you can obtain uh, both a topographic map and also a thermal map. Um, there are different types of thermal probes that we could use. And um, in here we have, I, I show some, uh, some of the most classical examples um, because I think this is very useful information in this community. On the one hand, we could use the more assistive probes and these probes basically have an element that is uh, whose electrical resistance actually depends on temperature. And this uh, correlation is uh, the one that you can see on top of the screen, where you see uh, R0, that is the electrical, uh, re electrical resistance of this element at that reference temperature, T0. And you have something that is very important, is the temperature coefficient of resistance that correlates how much is the change of this resistance versus temperature, right? And this is the temperature that we, uh, we have. So we have different types uh, that have different types of probes that can evolve over time. One of the classical ones and one of the first that was developed was the Wollaston probe that they use a Wollaston wire that has at the very tip a V-shaped platinum filament, which is the thermal resistive element that can actually um, obtain uh, temperature readings on the, on the surface of the sample. Um, but thanks to actually nanoengineering techniques, what we observe is that actually the idea was to downsize these kind of probes. And there has been a lot of progress in the last, uh, in the last years to actually reduce the size of these, uh, of these uh, thermoresistive probes. So we have seen this palladium, which is the thermoresistive element on silicon nitride or silicon oxide uh, substrates, four terminal probes or even doped semiconductors uh, probes that can be used for this thermal characterization. And on the other hand, we also have some uh, thermal voltage probes which use uh, two of these similar materials and take advantage of thermoelectric effects to also obtain temperature readings. That's classical, for example, effects in thermocouples, but in this case, we have nanoscale thermocouples. 
Another type of profs are, for example, thermal expansion that use two, la two by layers uh, that actually you know, react towards temperature difference and allow this thermal mapping of fluorescence uh, profs that actually this fluorescence is also related to temperature or even some of the, the new actually research is related also with superconducting junction that allows this kind of thermal mapping. Well, it's one of these props. I have very important features which determine what kind of thermal images you can get. And uh, there are important, um, important parameters or important uh, features like beyond the lateral re spatial resolution that are, for example, temperature resolution, thermal time constant, thermal sensitivity. That is important to select well, to select well your prop when doing, uh, when preparing yourself for doing, for carrying out some, some of these measurements. Uh, for more information about these props, I think I recommend that uh, you have a look at this paper at the bottom, which is a review on the field, and that can give you also very useful information uh, when you uh, want to carry out these thermal maps. Now, uh, I would like now to explain a bit how the STHM works. For, now, for this particular case, I'm going to use uh, thermal props uh, that are thermoresistive elements, in this case, palladium silicon nitride. In this picture, you see here uh, the palladium line, which is the thermoresistive element on top of uh, silicon nitride. And here you have a lateral view of this, uh, of this tip. These props are typically integrated in uh, Wisdom Bridge. Uh, so basically what you do here is to apply a bias across uh, this uh, Wisdom Bridge. And then what you have is a current that flows uh, across the tip. So when the, this current is, uh, is sufficient, then what you are going to assert is that this prop is going to self-heat due to your heating effects. And if you approach this tip to the surface of the sample, and this uh, sample has different thermal conductivities, what is going to happen is that you're going to have a heat flux exchange that will depend on the thermal conductivity of the sample. Since this is a thermoresistive probe, uh, then the, due to the different heat fluxes, the temperature of the probe will change, and therefore the electrical resistance of this probe will also change. Consequently, if you measure the voltage of the bridge, this voltage of the bridge is correlated to the changes on the electrical resistance and therefore correlated to change in the temperature. With this kind of method, with this kind of AFM technique, you can obtain simultaneously a topographic, but also a thermal map. And this is an example of a classical uh, carbon fiber epoxy composite with two different uh, areas that present different thermal conductivities, and then you can obtain such thermal map. It's very important to mention here that note that this uh, measurement is giving, since see, this is a thermal assistive probe, is giving in millivolts. So it doesn't give directly the temperature of uh, the probe, but instead it gives you the change in the, in the bridge voltage. Now at this point, I think it's very important to understand a bit better how the STHM works, is that we have two different, uh, two possibilities for measuring. One is the active mode, in which case you actually uh, heat up the probe. So the probe is acting as a heating element. And then you transfer heat from the probe to the sample surface. And the second case is the passive mode. And in this particular case is the sample which heats up and then the heat is transferred from the sample to the, uh, to the probe and the cantilever. Now there are, if you look at the thermal network, uh, it's very important you see here in these two modes, a contact thermal resistance that, is, uh, that happens between the surf and the probe. And that depends on the solid to solid uh, thermal resistance. So that's actually the solid to solid uh, uh, contact between the probe and the sample surface. The conduction uh, across the air, the influence of the water meniscus, the thermal resistance due to the water meniscus, and also thermal resistance due to radiative process. Now, uh, when we talk about this heat transfer mechanism, uh, it's also important to mention that we have two different uh, potential modes uh, within this. And this is the contact mode in which, once again, you see here the parallel thermal network that you have, in which you have solid to solid conduction. And this solid to solid conduction happen in this small uh, region, which is defined by these uh, radius of contact between the tip and the sample surface. And then the rest of the process is like radiation, water meniscus, that you see here, diffusive and transition or ballistic, depending on, on the vicinity of the prop to the surface. In the end, they result in an area of exchange of heat that is defined by the thermal exchange radius that is here named or labeled as B. Okay, that's also a very important parameter. And in the non-contact mode, of course, you don't have the water meniscus and the solids to solid heat transfer, but still you have the radiation, the air conduction 
still here is very important to notice, to notice that you have a thermal exchange radius, which is the area, once again, at which the heat is exchanged between the probe and the sample surface. With this in mind, um, in order to get to extract useful information on the thermal properties of your sample, uh, in the active mode, you need to take into account that this heat that is transferred between the tip and the sample is equal to the difference of temperature between the tip and the atmospheric conditions. And also you need to account for the contact thermal resistance, which I explained before, and then the sample thermal resistance. If you know all the other parameters, then you can extract the sample thermal uh, resistance, which is the one that we are interested in. And here you can notice that this thermal resistance can be written in terms of the thermal conductivity of the sample, a parameter that is very much interesting in multiple cases. But note that, that you also need to know the thermal exchange radius to characterize these, uh, these uh, properties, for example, the thermal conductivity. For thin films, and in case they are semi-infinite, so this, uh, you observe here that again, you have the thermal conductivity of the substrate. Also, you need the thermal change radius, but now you have now a factor that depends on the thickness of the thin film, the thermal conductivity of the film, and the thermal change, uh, the square of the thermal change radius. With these kind of equations, and this is a simplified model, because of course these heat transfer mechanisms can be even more complex, but you can extract very useful thermal properties. In the passive mode, the situation is different because here we are interested in the, in the temperature of the, of the surface of the sample. And if you know all the rest of the parameters like contact thermal resistance, the tip uh, temperature and the heat that is transferred to the uh, surface and the tip, uh, then you can obtain and you can sense the temperature that you have on the surface. At this point, I think it's uh, very important to, to mention that in order to do that, in order to extract the thermal change radius or the contact thermal resistance, there are multiple calibration strategies that can be implemented that you need to take into account to be accurate in the determination of these properties. For that, once again, I recommend you have a look at this uh, review paper that I wrote a couple of years ago that actually gives you that information and show you some strategies that you can use towards this end. Now, we have, I tried to give a less, say a little bit of background of the challenges that you have for this THM. And now I would like to mention that the area of applicability of the scanning thermal microscopy is very diverse. It goes from characterizing qualitatively and the thermal conductivity of thermoelectric materials, for example, uh, polymers or bio-related materials. Um, but I think more specifically, what brings me here today is related with thermal characterization of thermal properties of electronic, uh, of electronic devices made, for example, from 2D materials or phase change materials, among others. And that's what I'm going to focus uh, from now on. And one example is the GST, is, uh, is one type of phase change materials that is used uh, for memory devices. And uh, such memory devices are two terminal resistors that retain the resistance state as a function of the applied voltage or current. Among these, uh, we have phase change materials. In this case, I'm bringing germanium anti moon and telluria. Uh, this is a well-known phase change material for electronic community. And these materials can be set to a crystalline, uh, low resistive state, or and reset to an amorphous, high resistive state using electrical pulses. Here, it's important to say that self-heating and the local temperature play a major role in the principle of operation of these PCMs. So as an example, many advantages like energy efficiency, improved with the scaling, and shortcomings like reliability of this technology stem from this inherent dependence on self-heating. Therefore, understanding the energy and heat dissipation mechanisms is key for the evaluation, design, and optimization of all such future technology. Here, uh, I use scanning thermal microscopy uh, and a thermal resistive prop like the one that I showed before in order to obtain thermal maps of these GST uh, memory devices to obtain uh, this thermal information. If you look at this image, what you observe is that you have the GST in between uh, two electrodes, in this case made of uh, platinum, and then the thermal map on the right, which since we are sensing this is practically flat. It doesn't show any contract because there is no heating coming from the sample. If we start applying a bias to it, the current that is flowing through it, what we observe is that this sample is starting to heat up. And more inter interestingly, what we observe is that a great part of this heating is happening right at the contacts, as you can see over here. 
So you have some heating in the channel, but especially at the contacts. That suggests that power dissipation is being dominated by electrical contact resistance. This kind of information is very useful and can be actually extrapolated to other devices. At this point, I think it's very important to remember that we are using a thermoresistive, uh, thermoresistive prop. And therefore, we are not obtaining this, uh, the information directly in, in degrees, but instead we are measuring actually changes in the electrical resistance, or in this case, in cities in the Wisdom Bridge, we are measuring uh, changes in, in voltage. To calibrate that, uh, to, to convert these millivolts into uh, degrees, so what we can do is to use, for example, other techniques that help us to convert these millivolts into uh, temperature readings. And one example here that we use successfully is to combine this ST chain with Raman thermometry. The Raman is calibrated and is measuring uh, the temperature across this device. The gray areas correspond to the electrodes. And then you have the dots and the profile in blue that correspond to the temperature readings as the, the Raman scans over the, the device. But you see that the resolution, especially at the contact, is not that good. However, if we use part of this information to calibrate our STHM signal into temperature. Now we can take advantage of the way a more uh, highly spatially resolved thermometry technique that is the STHM to obtain uh, quantitative information of these, of these uh, uh, the information that is coming from these thermal maps. With this, you can obtain very key, for, uh, key parameters like the thermal boundary conductance between GST and silicon oxide or GST or platinum, or you can also get information about the GST thermal power, among other things. This is okay, but sometimes we don't have the possibility of calibrate uh, the signal that uh, we have from the STHM and convert it directly through another technique. And one clear example is uh, the one that we obtain from the resistive switching in resistive uh, random access memory devices. In these particular devices, for, for those who are not familiarized, these kind of devices work on the formation or based on the formation and rupture of conductive filaments in thin metal oxides. One example of this memory device is the one that you see here that, is, uh, that contains two uh, electrodes, two platinum electrons, and in the middle you have the hafnium oxide, which is this type of thin metal oxide that I was talking before. And uh, what you do uh, in, across these type of devices is to actually uh, form or, or you know, create the rupture of a conductive film. Let me explain a bit better how this works. When you have such configuration, and if you start applying bias to, across these two electrodes, what you assert is that at the beginning, uh, when you apply bias, there is a very little current that flows through it because of course you have an oxide here. This is what we call the high resistivity state. However, at some point, and when we reach a particular bias, what we observe is that there is a spike in the current, and then we go from the high resistive state to the low resistive state, and there is more current flowing to it. This happens because there is a conductive filament that is formed between the top electrode and bottom electrode, and this, this, this filament is actually in the nanoscale. It has a, di a diameter that is uh, just few uh, nanometer uh, in diameter. So it's very small, but the loss of current flows through it. So it typically uh, is expected to heat up very much. This, this kind of behavior can be reversed by applying uh, the reverse voltage. And then you move from the high resistive state to low resistive state and so on and so forth. These are the Z11 of our uh, memory devices. Now, in this case, we could try to use an approach similar to the one that I mentioned before to compare to other technique, but the spatial resolution that the STHM achieve allows us to observe the really hot spots that they're coming from the filaments that are formed in these uh, particular devices. And we can see them at the surface of the electrode. If we try to do the same with another technique like the Raman again, what we observe is that this, the resolution of this Raman technique is not enough to, to obtain, to make a, a calibration of the STHM. So we need to use a different approach for that. At Stanford University, we also came up with a strategy to actually uh, calibrate this technique. As I mentioned before, we have uh, multiple parameters like the thermal exchange radius and the contact resistance that need to be calibrated. And in this case, what we did in order to, to take into account these effects, as well as artifacts coming from the, from the roughness of the sample, is that we develop uh, lines, metal lines that were varying width from one micrometer to 50 nanometers. So when we were doing the STHM, we could actually, when we apply current through that, they are going to heat up, and then we are going to be able to see that in the STHM. 
These metal lines have a well-known temperature coefficient of resistance, so we know in advance how much they are going to heat up. And then if we know how much they heat up, and we know also what kind of defect or, or, or sorry artifacts we can have in the STHM due to the changes in the thing in the let's say the artifacts that you can have due to the to the roughness and due to the step uh, that you, we have right in between the substrate and the top of the metal line, we use a code that combines all this information and in the end gives us a, a, a calibration factor that converts the millivolts that we measure into Kelvin. And in this case, it's dependent on the line width. This is um, and this is actually the conversion factor that I was talking, millivolts into Kelvin, and this is the dependence on the width. Uh, the width will somehow represent actually the change of these um, thermal exchange radius that I was talking before, this V factor. And what we observe is that actually this is very important. This affects especially at very, at very small features in which we truncate partially the thermal exchange radius or when the heating features is, are really small, like the one that we observe, for example, from the uh, heating of the filament. With this information, we are able to convert these uh, the hot spots into temperature readings, and now we can explore, we can measure the temperature, we can quantify this information, and we can explore it at different uh, powers of the sample. Now, this is already very useful. We can measure the temperature, but remember that we measure the temperature at the top of the surface. So if we want to know exactly what is the temperature of the, of the filament based on the temperature that we measure at the surface of the sample, it's important to take into account the potential drops of interfaces due to thermal boundary conductance that we have in these uh, different uh, layers. And also these kind of uh, uh, simulations can reveal that the temperature of the filaments could achieve very, very high values of temperature as you can see in this slide when they hit in less than 10 nanometer diameter. So the problem here is that this is a very good uh, reading on top of the surface of the device, but look that we are 55 nanometer far uh, from the filament compared to the surface. And we wanted to make it closer in order to, to avoid these kind of effects of interfaces and to get closer to the filament temperature reading. In order to do that, we uh, use an ultimate uh, approach that was to use ultra thin single layer graphene as a top electrode. And this is the type of devices that you can, uh, you can observe in which you have actually the crossbar configuration of this device, the same kind of behavior that I was, I was explaining on the switching. And this type of devices actually perform quite well. Uh, we carried out STHM on devices with the, again, a graphene as a top electrode, and we were also able to observe this uh, heating um, uh, that is coming from, from uh, filaments that are formed in this hafium oxide. And now we are really close to these uh, filaments. And from all this information, uh, what we were able to obtain is like uh, what we did and to obtain also more information about interfaces and to get more information about the temperature of this filament. What we were doing is to vary also the thickness of the top electrode from the original situation to later on uh, smaller only with 15 nanometers of titanium tri, two layers of graphene or single layer, but allow us a careful char characterization of the temperature of these filaments as we were changing the top electrode, as you can see in this figure, but also as we were changing the power that was applied to these uh, devices. Not only that, but I think it's also worth mentioning that we were able to do in operando STHM in which we position the STHM tip on top of the on top of the filament or the heating that it was coming from the filament, and with that we were able to do uh, cycles of set and reset. And here you can see the temperatures that we were achieving as we were uh, sweeping uh, the the let's say the power and doing set and reset or forming or you know uh, destroying the filament. Uh, in these particular type of samples. This is a very unique uh, result because it's the first time that actually we have been able to, uh, to characterize the, the temperature of these filaments in these type of memories. And these results reveal also the importance of thermal engineering for nanoscale resistive random access memory devices toward ultra dense data storage or neuromorphic cooperation. Their standing this heat dissipation is essential to uh, later on also develop these kind of architectures. Now, to give uh, some more examples, and just also to conclude a bit my presentation, I also worth mentioning that we carried out similar type of measurements in other exciting memory devices. This is another 2D material, in this case, molybdenum detail, right? In which, uh, the, in this case, 
the type in which uh, uh, these type of memories are called con uh, conductive bridge uh, memory devices, in which what we form is actually a conductive uh, bridge of this kind from the goal uh, electrode at the bottom and is forming a conductive path. And then it also going to heat up as we can see it here in the stitch image, which we can also detect and we can also understand better what is the heat dissipation and the performance of these type of devices. Similar things can be done in the in other type of uh, memories. In this case, we have the MOT insulators, which is VO2. In this case, we're using a carbon nanotube on top of that uh, to in order to reduce uh, the voltage and power required uh, by control uh, compared to, for example, control devices without carbon nanotubes, and we're able to reduce that kind of voltage that kind of voltage and power by half by introducing this carbon nanotube. In these kind of thermal maps, what we can observe here, you can see the carbon nanotube with the VO2 uh, here lay and the palladium electrodes. And then here you can obtain and the thermal maps and you can see what also is the influence on how, how the actually thermal engineering can help to improve uh, device behavior. With that, I would like to conclude by, uh, by saying that uh, I would like to highlight that STHM is a unique thermometry technique that has rapidly attracted the attention of electrical engineers to characterize uh, the energy dissipation in, in electronics. Um, today, I tried to give some examples on how to apply this thermometry technique to obtain nanoscale thermal maps of different types of memories and other electronic devices. And I think this gives us fundamental uh, insights on the performance uh, of these and, and the effects of the thermal effects that we have in these electronics. And with these, we can actually, uh, you know, avoid thermal crosstalk between, between devices, facilitating energy efficient electronics. And in my view, this is absolutely essential for understanding and optimizing ultra dense data storage. I would like to conclude my presentation by, um, by uh, saying that, uh, that actually I would like to especially thank the group of Professor Pop from Stanford University, where I carried uh, this uh, great part of the work that I presented today um, when I was there as a, as a postdoc. And I would also like to thank all his uh, group members, some of which uh, you know, uh, provide a key role to fabricate or characterize these devices and who are especially acknowledged here. I would also like to, to, to thank some of the funding agencies that made possible this work uh, where, I, where I was at Stanford. And my group at the University of Twente continues doing research associated with STHM on some of these um, special uh, devices that I was talking before, on thermal management with knowledge control devices or the use of thermal materials and devices for energy harvesting. If you are interested in some of these research lines, please visit our webpage and do not hesitate to contact us. We are looking forward to, to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice, uh, very interesting topic. I like it very much. So Thank now you. let's see the questions from our audience. So you can also read at the chart, in the chart. So the first one is what, what is the resolution of the STHM technique? Okay, the resolution of the STHM technique um, um, it, uh, especially when, we, when I was talking about the heat transfer mechanism, you need to think uh, from the point of view of the thermal change radius. This thermal change radius is uh, the heat uh, or the area at which is like a heat disk and it's the area in which you exchange heat with the, with the sample surface. This happens both for passive and, and or for at, the, at least for the, for the active mode, right? So you think this is actually simpler when you see it from, from this perspective. So uh, when you, this thermal change radius in these kind of probes is limited by the different heat transfer mechanisms that I talked uh, before. So the water meniscus, the solid to solid, the conductive uh, air, and also the radiative, right? These in the end form this area at which you exchange heat. Uh, typically for probes, it depends on the probes and thus uh, depends also on these mechanisms. But typically uh, the thermal change radius is around 100 nanometers. That would be some kind of the, the rule of thumb or even, even higher. Okay. Okay, thank you. So our next question is from Professor Mario Landa. And uh, he mentioned that in today's interview, uh, Professor O'Shaw mentioned that obtaining absolute values with conductive AFM is very challenging. How trustable are the absolute values of temperature registered with STHM? How big is the effect of contact force or tip radius on the values on the values registered? 
Yeah, this is an excellent question. And um, indeed, it's uh, very, very complicated to, to actually uh, accurately characterize the, and, uh, or quantify or convert this qualitative information in quantitative information. In my presentation, I mentioned that the, one of the major challenges of this STHM, in, for example, thermoresistive probe, is to convert the millivolt signal into temperature. Uh, when you do that, uh, there are multiple calibration strategies that one can use. And uh, I think I mentioned, I, I referenced my, my review paper where you can actually check this out. There are different approaches. Um, each one has its pros and cons. Uh, but I think I need to agree on that. It's actually very challenging. In this particular case, for example, for sensing, we use uh, these, uh, the approach that I presented in which we were using these metal lines with different weights. And we try to, to convey there all the effects of the contact thermal resistance, of the, of the changes in the thermal change radius, the artifacts that are coming from topography. So all this needs to be into account to accurately convert these into temperature into degrees. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answers. So let's uh, look at the last question that uh, the, he asked, I'm wondering for STHM on RAM, a thin capping layer like aluminum oxide is necessary. Any other options for this kind of capping materials? Yeah, uh, the capping is, uh, is uh, necessary because uh, if you remember the image of the STHM prop that I presented, it was a thermal assistive prop um, made of palladium on top of silicon nitride. And the pro you need to have this kind of capping because uh, these uh, probes are electrically sensitive. So if you don't have, if you don't use uh, thin capping, you might have the risk at some point that you have some sort of discharge to the probe and then you easily break the probes. Especially if we, again, think back about the difficulties of calibrating each single probe, which you need to do it uh, for accurate uh, measurements. I think it's better to, to cap this with uh, this thin uh, capping layer. We use aluminum oxide, but there are other options uh, depend, yeah. it depends on your needs. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Munich Nojo.